Okay, so here we're going to attempt to do a little teaching this morning. Um, had a patient come in uh, a little bit ago who had uh, vertigo, dizziness for about a year and a half. Um, she's been seeking treatment in a lot of different places, hasn't had much for relief. Um, she uh, presents with uh, dizziness more so, it's pretty constant, uh, lightheadedness if you will, unsteadiness. But she has issues, especially when she bends forward or when she's doing anything in front of her. Uh, she works in retail, so that's very difficult for her. Um, but pretty much, you know, a lot of movement, different movements for her, very difficult. Um, and long story short, uh, you know, is fed up with it, essentially. Um, she also describes a lot of neck pain and headaches uh, in the past, which have been plaguing her, but not nearly as uh, uncomfortable you know, as this, uh, as this uh, dizziness and vertigo. And not surprisingly, as you'll see, uh, a lot of their headaches were on the left side uh, in the left hemisphere uh, region, uh, and she's getting quite frequently, still getting them quite frequently. And so we're going to look at her, and when we examine this patient, the key to uh, her success is going to be examining how that vestibular function is, is, is working with the rest of the brain. Um, when we looked at her, we noticed a couple things. She was swaying to her left, okay? So we had sway to the left, right? That alone doesn't mean a whole lot yet. Um, could be left cerebellar dysfunction, where the left cerebellum is not pushing inwards as much as the right, so the right's overpowering it. So when you close your eyes, put your feet together, you kind of sway to the left a bit, okay? All right, that's good. Uh, we looked at that, then we looked at uh, finger to nose, okay? What we noticed is that with her left uh, pinky, she was really missing her nose quite a bit. She wasn't, she wasn't hitting the actual bridge of her nose. Um, and that's more of a spatial awareness issue. Uh, that could be more that vestibular system itself, or it could be more the vestibular cerebellar connection uh, with the contralateral brain the contralateral parietal lobe, which picks up spatial awareness, body feedback, uh, sensory feedback from everything in your body. So we noticed that that was off. Then we did just a simple marching test, eyes closed, hands out in front of you, immediately has difficulty and sways to the left. Uh, that's pretty indicative of vestibular issues often. Okay. So we're looking at just a couple basic uh, cerebellar tests and we see, well, or vestibular tests, and we see that, uh, okay, well, we're seeing some predominance to the left side. All right. Well, you know, with her history, it makes sense. She feels like she falls to the left a little bit, you know, stuff like that. But what we do is then we look at some eye movements, right? Or, or actually look at her statically. So I had her stand there. I just looked at her. Her left eye is very elevated, okay? Her right eye is lower or depressed, and her head is tilted to the left side. So when we look at uh, differences in eye levels, we look at strengths of, different strengths of muscles. In her case, uh, what we noticed with her head tilt in conjunction with her elevation is that she had a lot of difficulty pursuing objects down into her right. Okay, so we call those cicadic pursuits. They're very choppy. She couldn't keep her eyes on my finger as it came down like this without moving her head. And it, it made her feel uncomfortable in the sense of lightheaded or it was, it was tough to focus on it. Um, other directions were easier. Up wasn't as bad. Um, the opposite side wasn't nearly as bad. Um, so we look at, uh, if we look a little closer here at my really fantastic drawing of what looks like a light bulb, but it's actually a human head. Um, this left eye, right, is elevated, okay? So we look at the function of what brings the eyes down and across the body right, like that, okay? And what also depresses the eye in the sense of what would be weak down here, if you will, right? That would cause the eye to go upwards. Well, it could be the inferior rectus isn't pulling it down enough, or it could be that the superior oblique muscle, which is, uh, works in adduction and pushes the eyes medially and inferiorly, okay, or in torsion, if you will, 
that's not working. It could be that this this side, the uh, depressed side, isn't is the the side in question. But because of our other testing, we're able to localize it more towards the left side. So we look at the superior oblique muscle as being potentially the main cause of some of this aberrant information into the vestibular system, um, or causing a weird vestibular ocular reflex. We'll call it okay. So the superior oblique pushes the eyes down like this. Okay. And that's weak. So when we tested her, that wasn't there. So I say, well, well what, what canal does that kind of match up with in that left vestibular system, right, over in this aspect here, right, which we've drawn? Um, that area is called the posterior canal of the semicircular canal of that vestibular system. So we say, well, okay, we start looking towards our main, our main issues. You know, we look at the superior oblique, looking at the posterior canal, on the left side, right? On the left side. So, and we say, well, what, what does this vestibular, cerebellar, brainstem, cortical connection do? What, why is there spatial awareness? Why is, why is that stuff off? Well, because that vestibular system communicates with the cerebellum here, specifically the floccul flocculonodular lobe, okay, which then connects to the vestibular nuclei of the brainstem, okay, in the pons, right? So, Information coming from the body, right, that, that's perceived in the vestibular system has to go to the rest other parts of the brain. So that's this I'm showing you where it goes. Then that goes to the contralateral parietal lobe, okay? Perceived there, right? And then from the parietal lobe, it does a number of different things. So it's the frontal lobe for motor cortex or actual movement, right? Or it goes posteriorly into the uh, occipital lobe or inferiorly into the temporal lobe, whatever it needs to do but oftentimes to that motor cortex area to then fire back down and make a shift, okay? Now, now we've, we've looked at those things, right, neurologically. Now, what's interesting is that with her, the left uh, C1 vertebrae is pushed laterally and stuck right, right kind of in through here, so it's not moving very well, and that region is vitally important for input or feedback to that vestibular region. So that also is the area that causes headaches. So we kind of put two and two together. We're able, I, after palpation, after localizing where that issue is, um, it goes along perfectly with everything else we're finding. So we say, okay, that makes sense. Uh, that's going to be a major player in this issue is the C1 area or that occipital region, suboccipital region on the left side. Then what we do is we say, okay, what else is going on? Well, what, the other major thing I found with her is that her anterior rib cage, okay, the actual, the actual ribs joints here, which can be seen, my buddy here, right in through here, these are joints that have to move and expand in order for your lungs to inflate, right? If your ribs can't expand, then your lungs inside cannot inflate, and therefore you can, cannot get enough oxygen in. She's also been feeling short of breath lately. Um, she gets anxiety, which makes sense, right? If you don't have enough oxygen to your brain, you're going to be anxious. Uh, in the same case here, except it's not just anxiety, it's more so her brain function is depressed a bit. Uh, even though she's a very nice girl, very, very you know, uh, good personality, everything like that, but if that if these highly metabolic areas like the vestibular inner ear areas, the cerebellum, um, other parts aren't getting enough oxygen, then things aren't going to function well. So it's going to decrease the function, you know, flat out from, from the get-go. So we have to increase that oxygen to drive the nervous system or the, the neuraxis in this vestibular cerebellar region um, so that the information can be perceived with enough juice to actually do something with it, right? If you don't have enough gas in the, in the car, you're not getting anywhere. Same thing with that vestibular and cerebellar area. We need nutrition. We need oxygen to drive it. Then what we can do it, what I can do here is retrain that region so that the eye movements are more fluid, the vestibular system is now functioning better, it's communicating with other parts of the brain, and it's not a problem. How we're going to do that is pretty simple, actually. We're going to do that through increasing the oxygenation, increasing that movement of that C1, and because we're able to localize a specific cause of her problem, now we're doing specific eye exercises in the posterior canal plane or down into the right 
doing pursuit exercises that she's going to do at home for the majority of the time, um, as well as in here to some degree, which are going to be able to retrain that vestibular ocular reflex.